Good afternoon. I'm Gordon Shen, Assistant Professor of Healthcare Management at the University of Texas Health Science Center at Houston School of Public Health. I'm also the moderator for Plenary Session 4, Building Capacity for Non-Communicable Diseases in Resource Challenge Settings. Before I introduce the five speakers who are joining me, I want to give special thanks to several key people who played an instrumental role in organizing this panel. Wumi Aibana, Diva Ayangar, Shubra Ghosh, and Kara Fossey. Without you all, uh, we would not be able to showcase the talent of the University of Texas Health Institutions. I should also add that the U UT Health McGovern School of Medicine is one of the advocates for CGH 2021. I also wanna give credit to Kevin Martin, Dalal Najjar, Jenna Smith, and Blanca Broschek for their hard work in organizing this year's conference proceedings. Next, I wanna to introduce to you the five speakers in order of presentation. First, it's Kathleen Schmieler. Kathleen is professor of gynecological oncology and reproductive medicine at the University of Texas MD Anderson Center. She'll be co-presenting with Cecilina Lorenzoni, who is the head of the National Cancer Control Program of the Republic of Mozambique. Again, Dr. Schwiller and Dr. Lorenzoni will be co-presenting their work in Mozambique. Next up will be Hima Gopalan, who is the head of research and community projects at the National Diabetes, Obesity, and Cholesterol Foundation. Dr. Gopalan delivered her presentation in a pre-recorded video from India. She unfortunately cannot join us for the Q&A due to the time zone difference. Related to her presentation is one from Dr. Lewis Foxhall, who is Professor and Vice President of Health Policy at the University of Texas MD Anderson Cancer Center. Last but not least is Dr. Susan Fenton, Associate Professor and Associate Dean for Academic and Curricular Affairs at the University of Texas Health Science Center at Houston School of Biomedical Informatics. You can find their bios as well as my bio on the CUGH website. Just a reminder, we invite questions and comments from the audience throughout the presentations. Feel free to do so through the Q&A box um, and any questions that remain unanswered, we will discuss them verbally um, as part of the last portion of this plenary session. Now, without further ado, I'll turn the floor over to Dr. Schmiller and Dr. Lorenzoni. Um, it's a pleasure for Dr. Lorenzoni and I to present today about our program for reducing cervical cancer uh, in Mozambique. Uh, and I'll turn it over to Cecil Tina to start. Thank you, Kathleen. Good afternoon and good evening for everyone. And thank you all for this opportunity to present the program for reducing cervical cancer in Mozambique. And I would like to also thank all of you that organized this conference. And especially thank you for the colleagues from MD Anderson, Katrin Schmeida, Shubra Ghosh, and Ellen Baker that they work with us in Minister of Health. I will present this uh, program for reducing cervical cancer in Mozambique with Dr. Kathleen. She is a key person for the successful of cervical cancer control implementation in Mozambique. Mozambique is a country located at the southeast of Africa. We have a population about 29 million and the language is Portuguese and we have about 40 dialects. The HIV rate in Mozambique is very high, about 12% nationality and in some urban areas we have more than 20%. Cervical cancer in Mozambique. Mozambique is one of the highest cervical cancer rates in the world. The cases per year, it's about 5,000 5, cases per year and about 3,000 deaths per year. 
and cervical cancer corresponded about 34% of all cancer cases in women. We have high rates of incidence, about 42.8 for incidence and mortality about 35.7. And few than 5% of women and ever received the cervical cancer screening as VIA or pap smear. We have only about 115 health centers performed the VIA and the cryotherapy, and also few providers training to perform the colposcopy and lip. Until now, we have about 10 lip machines in the country, and most women presented with advantage disease and palliative care services are very limited in Mozambique. About how our collaboration, Mozambique and the Anderson and Brazil. We begin in 2014 by invitation of the former first lady Maria da Luz Gebuza and the current first lady Excellency Isaura Nunes and the Minister of Health in Mozambique. In 2016, we signed the Memorandum of Understanding between MD Anderson and the Minister of Health and included areas like clinical and surgical training in cancer prevention and treatment, also for research and capacity building for cervical cancer prevention. You can see in the picture, uh, we see the, the former first lady and the actual first lady with the colleagues of MD Anderson. Uh, just to, to show you in this picture, because we focus in Mozambique on cervical cancer prevention, you can see in the, in, in the picture there is a nurse that is assisting the woman at a health facility unit for maternal and child program. The nurses in Mozambique, they can perform a cervical examination and do the VIA and the cryotherapy. And our program included the woman at 25 to 54 years old, included the HIV woman. And thank you for attention. So most of the work that um, our team has been doing with Cecil Tina and her colleagues has been both in the areas of building clinical capacity as well as research capacity. Um, we've been traveling to Mozambique since 2016. Uh, we've had 13 visits total. Um, and in all of these visits, we've had in-country workshops. Um, I'm a gynecologic oncologist, and most of the work I do is related to cervical cancer and other gynecologic malignancies. But we have teams from, of uh, breast cancer specialists, head and neck cancer specialists, as well as hematologic malignancy um, experts who have come from MD Anderson, um, but also primarily from um, our partnering uh, Brazilian institutions because of the Portuguese language. We do a lot of hands-on training, primarily in surgery. Um, also do a lot of work with the medical oncologists, um, technical courses, um, and in particular, colposcopy and LEAP, some of the procedures we perform for cervical cancer prevention. We've had many trainee exchanges, um, again, primarily with Brazil. So there's a head and neck uh, surgeon from uh, Mozambique who spent two years um, in Brazil at AC Camargo. Um, and then our gynecologic oncology colleagues have spent time um, at three different hospitals in Brazil as well. Um, we have a gynecologic oncology fellowship now in Mozambique that I'll talk a little bit more about, and then also do a lot of work in the area of research. Um, so specific to colposcopy and LEAP training, again, these are procedures to help prevent cervical cancer. Um, they're performed in women who have abnormal pap tests or positive HPV tests um, when we can diagnose them prior to the cancer becoming 
uh, prior to the lesion becoming invasive cancer. And as Cecil Tina said, um, cervical cancer is the number one cancer among women in Mozambique. Um, in the US, it doesn't even make the, the top 10. Um, and that's thanks to organized screening and very importantly, treatment of women who have abnormal results. So since 2016, we've had 12 hands-on training workshops um, with over 170 different individuals from around the country attending. Um, the training includes um, a day of lectures and then practice with um, some stations where we have uh, simulation models to do these procedures. And then we spend a few days in the clinics with the providers um, in their uh, cities, actually seeing patients and providing um, some teaching and supervision uh, to perform the, the procedures. We use Project ECHO, a telementoring program that many of you may be familiar with, um, which consists of monthly video conferences where our team from um, our teams from MD Anderson and from Brazil uh, meet with the doctors and nurses via video conference via Zoom um, to continue to um, provide teaching and mentoring. Um, we've had many changes with COVID, obviously. Um, and so we have uh, changed a lot of our uh, colposcopy and LEAP training to a virtual format. Fortunately, we had been working there for five years prior to the pandemic. So we have many experts in country now who serve as local mentors and local teachers, um, and we can assist from uh, Houston. Um, we continue to have the monthly Project ECHO conferences, um, and we provide technical support um, as needed to the Ministry of Health. Um, we were very involved in um, assisting them with putting together their cancer control plan um, that Dr. Foxhall will talk a little bit more about in, um, in his talk. And then we provide mentoring um, for the local um, teachers and experts in country. Um, here's a picture of um, one of our courses in uh, Nampula, uh, Mozambique, one of the cities uh, north of Maputo. And you can see here um, our group from MD Anderson, um, as well as uh, our colleagues from Brazil um, working with the, the team in Nampula. I'm just gonna talk for a minute about uh, our gynecologic oncology fellowship program. Um, this is um, done through the International Gynecologic Cancer Society or IGCS. Um, this is a program that we started uh, to have formal training in gynecologic oncology in regions of the world uh, where that doesn't currently exist. Um, the training is done in country. We have 12 programs around the world. Um, we use a web-based curriculum um, in Mozambique. Mozambique was one of our first uh, five pilot sites, um, and it's a partnership between the um, Central Hospital in Maputo, um, the Ministry of Health, and then we have international faculty from five different institutions in Brazil, uh, as well as our team at MD Anderson. Prior to COVID, we were traveling to Maputo about four to five times a year. Um, and then the fellows do most of their training in country in Mozambique, uh, but they do spend one to two months in the um, country and institution of one of the, or many of the international faculty. So our fellows were able to go to uh, Brazil. Um, the, the program is at least two years in length, um, and it has a final exam uh, with a certificate at the, at the completion. The, um, so the program started um, in Maputo in 2017, and we, uh, three gynecologists, were selected to train to become gynecologic oncologists. Um, as I said, we had regular visits and also had uh, virtual tumor boards every month. Um, the fellows log their surgical cases um, and they uh, did 69 cases with the Brazilian mentors and then subsequently um, did 44 um, independently in between the visits and following the visits. 
Um, and so we're very proud of our three fellows, um, Ciro, Darcy, and Ricardina, who graduated in October of 2020 and are actually the first gynecologic oncologists um, in the country of Mozambique. And so now they are about to become the local mentors for our next class of fellows who um, are currently undergoing the, the selection process. This is a picture of Mila Salcedo, one of the uh, mentors from Brazil and myself um, working uh, with the, the fellows in Mozambique and teaching in the operating room. And again, a lot of hands-on training, but also um, tumor boards via Zoom, um, Project Echo, and lots of virtual teaching as well. Um, we also uh, have a strong research partnership uh, with Cecil Tina and her team. Um, our first um, trial that it was the first trial we had done from MD Anderson in Mozambique called the Capilana study. And it was uh, using HPV testing as primary screening for cervical cancer. Um, this um, led to a, a publication, which you can see on the right-hand side, um, but we were able to show that we could meet the WHO um, metric of more than 90% of women with an abnormal screening test uh, completing all steps of their diagnostic workup and treatment. Um, so this is really the way that um, we can prevent cervical cancer and stop it from being the number one cancer uh, among women in Mozambique. Um, we were fortunate to have the gynecologic oncology fellowship program in parallel so that any women that we did diagnose with cancer were able to get um, the care that um, they needed for their invasive cancer. We have recently um, started a large um, study uh, funded by USAID evaluating innovative technologies and approaches to addressing cervical cancer in Mozambique. Um, women are doing self-collected HPV testing um, and then treatment with thermal coagulation. Um, and then this is done in um, at the time of their visits for voluntary family planning. So it's bringing together the uh, family planning services with cervical cancer screening services. Um, so we're very fortunate to work with Cecil Tina and her team at the ministry, as well as at Maputo Central Hospital, as well as uh, PSI Population Services International um, on, this, on this big program. Um, we also are testing new technologies developed by Rice University uh, in Houston um, to be able to screen, diagnose, and treat cervical precancerous lesions uh, more effectively and more in a more cost-effective manner. Um, I'll just end there, but we thank you very much for your attention and for inviting us to present at the CUGH conference. Thank you. Thank you, Kathleen and Cecil Tina. Um, the, their presentation was, uh, is emblematic of bilateral and trilateral work that's being done to control cervical cancer. Next, we have a country-specific focus on human resources for health from Dr. Gobalan. I will play her video. Good day to you all. I thank the CUGH team for inviting me here to present. I'm sure that with their excellent management, this is going to be a highly successful and a stimulating conference. The National Diabetes Obesity Cholesterol Foundation, NDOC in short, is a non-governmental, not-for-profit organization uh, catering to improving awareness of diabetes and related disorders. The topic given to me is task shifting by involving community health workers in detection and management of diabetes and related diseases. India is a highly populated country with a 1.4 billion population. We form about 18% of the total world population. We happen to be one of the youngest uh, countries in the world with a median age of 28.4 years and about 35% of our population lives in urban areas. That means that 65% of our population still lives in rural areas today. As for diabetes, according to the IDF, 
uh, we have a prevalence. India has a prevalence of diabetes in adults of 8.9%. We have a total of 77 million people afflicted with this disease. With the economic liberalization in the late 1990s, there has been a steady rise of non-communicable diseases in India. We can see that there has been a threefold increase in the prevalence of uh, diabetes from 26 million in 1990 to 77 million today. If we look at the urban rural differences in India, we can see that in the urban, in the rural areas, diabetes is prevalent among the higher socioeconomic strata. But in the urban areas, it is more prevalent in the lower socioeconomic strata. The Indian healthcare system um, is a very important player for the community health card. So here we have both the um, we have both the public as well as the private uh, system. And what is more most important for this topic is to focus on the primary health center and the sub center where our community health workers play a crucial role. We have uh, three frontline workers uh, in our health system, the accredited social health activist, Asha, the urban or the urban social health activist, Usha. Uh, we, we call them Asha in the rural areas and Usha in the urban areas. These uh, frontline workers focus on maternal and child health, including immunizations and institutional deliveries. The Anganwadi worker runs the Anganwadi Center and focuses on provision of food supplements to young children, adolescent girls, and lactating women. Finally, we come to the auxiliary nurse midwife, who is always based at the sub-center, and uh, her, her job is mainly related to deliveries. So the initial work profile uh, when they began was to focus on reproductive, maternal, newborn, child health, infectious diseases, and nutrition. But since the 1970s, infant mortality rate has declined, maternal mortality rate has declined, and fertility rate has declined, and life expectancy has gone up. So the country has made great progress in maternal and child health, infectious diseases like malaria, tuberculosis, uh, leprosy, diarrheas, respiratory diseases. The government therefore anticipated that the workload due to these conditions may have declined and decided to task shift these, um, these frontline workers to the next significant challenge, the non-communicable diseases. These are replacing communicable diseases maternal and child health problems as a leading cause of death and disease. To tackle this, the government has introduced the National Program for Prevention and Control of Cancer, Diabetes, Cardiovascular Diseases, and Stroke, NPCDCS. The program was launched in 2010, and the basic premise is prevention through health promotion, early diagnosis, management, and referral. So where do our frontline workers fit in? These are the first level at which the health promotion and early diagnosis is taken care of. At the community level, the ASHA is the prominent player. She takes care of the estimation, enumeration of population, identifying at-risk individuals and health promotion. Here, the ANM or the multipurpose worker plays a supportive role only. But at the facility level, the ANM plays the prominent role, taking care of screening, follow up, and management. And the ASHA plays the supporting role. So, this is how task shifting of the ASHAs and ANMs is being carried out at the government institutions. If one looks at some of the studies carried out on task shifting, one can see that it is a mixed bag. This particular study carried out in Assam, um, a time motion study, states that on any working day, 
maternal and child health still receive great priority over uh, improving cancer outcomes. Another study conducted down south has shown that task shifting has been a successful exercise where the community health worker is able to successfully engage, screen, examine, refer, and follow up patients in the community. Yet another study studying the effect of community health worker-based approach to integrated cardiovascular risk factor control showed that it was positive for some outcomes and not positive in some other outcomes. Our own experience at NDOC has been very positive. The diabetes care at doorsteps was a study uh, funded by the WDF uh, Denmark and among our many objectives was um, uh, training of primary healthcare workers and registered medical practitioners. We focused on 10 underprivileged areas in the Delhi NCR, in Delhi NCR, and we successfully carried out task shifting of local leaders, also known as Pradhans, religious leaders, and also youth groups, community health workers like the ASHA, Anganwadi worker, local self-help groups. And we also created a cadre of community ambassadors for NDOC. We also managed to sensitize and train medical and paramedical workers. Our outreach, we reached about, uh, we've been able to sensitize and uh, have awareness session for nearly uh, 2 million people. Uh, that included local workers, local leaders, I'm sorry. And uh, we've trained about 292 community health workers and 256 paramedical workers. Our current study, Women's Awareness Initiative, is also a WDF-funded study. Uh, we've focused on women because we find that women in the northern parts of India are distinctly overweight and are more diabetic than their male counterparts. Also, their social standing in the family being poor and literacy levels being poor, their awareness about the disease is very minimal. So among our several objectives, the, the objective of training community health workers is also there in this study. The rationale used to educate community health workers is using very simple messaging techniques. We use the maternal and child health as a base and segued in on the main theme of diabetes. And then we spoke of nutrition, overweight, importance of physical activity, how to tackle gestational diabetes, the kind of diet to be used uh, during, these, uh, uh, during gestational diabetes, what are the good foods and bad foods that can be used uh, for diabetics, so on and so forth. The messages were kept very simple and related to uh, maternal and child health with a small single message being added on. For example, maternal and child health, we know the importance of breastfeeding. So an additional message of the breastfeed ba breastfed baby growing at a normal growth trajectory, preventing obesity, along with long-term protection protection against development of diabetes in later life was added. The results till date, we've trained about 254 of a total of 400, 450 target community health workers. And our knowledge and attitude practice pre and post test show that uh, there has been a significant improvement in knowledge. We hope to show that 75% of the trained community health workers will demonstrate competent understanding of gestational diabetes, uh, diabetes mellitus, obesity, overweight, health, and nutrition. While these solutions may sound very simplistic to the developed world, we believe that if the same message is repetitively used by various agencies, it does impact on the learning process. To summarize, the battle against NCDs is a work in progress in India, with the NPCDCS being a new program, relatively new program. Task shifting of community health workers from maternal and child health to non-communicable diseases will take time, but it's definitely achievable. 
the encouraging factor being that the community health worker program is a smooth running one. India, however, is a diverse country and the community health worker program does not operate in the same way in different underserved areas. These workers often tend to get overburdened by other tasks beyond their profile. Engaging stakeholders, other stakeholders, private sector, civil society could help in the task shifting process. Thank you. Hey, um, Dr. Kabbalah, I wanted me to let you know um, that what's on slide 18 is not a typo, um, and indeed the outreach was 2.2 million people. Nonetheless, task shifting is a way to implement the NCD guidelines in spite of workforce shortage. And as you've seen in Dr. Gopalan's presentation, um, it is an evidence-based practice that in her initiative, she continues to monitor, evaluate, and learn from. Okay. Next would be a complementary telementoring model that Kathleen had mentioned and that Dr. Fox Hall will speak more about. Lou, over to you. Thank you, Gordon. Appreciate it. Thanks to the organizers and thanks to my fellow panelists for the opportunity to present. And we want to talk in this uh, piece a bit about uh, some work that we do uh, with uh, uh, MD Anderson Cancer Center faculty who are uh, working on a policy approach to uh, cancer control. And this is done in collaboration with the uh, a group called the International Cancer Control Partnership. This is uh, organized and directed uh, uh, through a steering committee with uh, significant support from the NCI Office of uh, Global Health. So the idea of this is to pull together interested organizations and individuals who are working to help countries establish a national cancer control plan to think through what their, the nature of their cancer problem and try to work in a systematic way to establish approaches, evidence-based approaches uh, to develop uh, a uh, rational, and prioritize uh, interventions that can help reduce the cancer burden. So uh, we're working to, uh, along with, with all these in, individuals and other groups to uh, achieve the WHO NCD control goals. So these are the organizations who work with us in this uh, uh, partnership and we uh, uh, work closely and get contributions from these uh, groups who help us to uh, approach uh, countries and work with the leadership in countries and the public health and uh, both civil society and government to develop plans to implement and uh, reduce the uh, cancer uh, incidence and mortality uh, across their particular parts of the world. So we have uh, groups uh, that we primarily work with through MD Anderson are, are related to providing technical assistance to countries. So as uh, countries come to us and they're interested in uh, developing or uh, reinvigorating a, a plan that they have, then we provide some resources and, and help them uh, move along that uh, path. So many countries, most countries have an NCD plan but uh, uh, not as many have a cancer control plan specifically within that NCD uh, arena. NCDs, of course, encompass a number of areas, including uh, diabetes and metabolic diseases, as was just mentioned, but cancer is certainly one uh, that is of uh, growing concern in many parts of the world. So our technical assistance group uh, is representatives from these various organizations who have some experience in helping uh, develop uh, cancer control plans and helping facilitate their implementation. So we review existing plans, uh, uh, provide uh, input and feedback and direction to those who have not yet uh, developed a plan and work with those who have a plan to uh, facilitate a prioritized implementation. So uh, we try to help uh, promote 
uh, ideas such as, as what uh, uh, Kathleen and Cecil Tina were uh, talking about in specific areas that, that are big problems in some parts of the world and uh, have been uh, approached and uh, improved with, uh, with the methodical evidence-based interventions as they were describing. So we try to work with the different countries and help them get to that point so that they can begin to work uh, toward those sorts of implementations. So uh, we have uh, opportunities to interact with countries and they reach out to us uh, through uh, the various organizations, primarily through the NCI office, the uh, Union for International Cancer Control, uh, IAEA and WHO uh, to reach out and, and let us know that they're interested in working on uh, developing a plan or implementing plan or updating a plan. So uh, we are trying to contact countries proactively that we know uh, are in need of uh, uh, development or enhancement of their plans and uh, performed a review of all of the cancer plans in the globally that we could identify uh, a couple of years ago. And that really gave us a great uh, baseline for uh, the parts of the world that need additional uh, input and work. So uh, we've also are using the uh, ECHO model, as Kathleen mentioned, uh, providing telementoring uh, to countries who are ready to implement and prepared to move uh, in the direction of, uh, of putting their plans into action. So, uh, so their countries are in different stages of readiness to uh, develop or implement a plan. So we try to understand where they are, get them in touch with the appropriate people in their uh, countries or other cancer control organizations or uh, supported parties in their countries if they don't have a plan help them with uh, drafting or updating their plan, and then eventually uh, helping them with uh, implementation. And right now we're using this uh, uh, ECHO model for, uh, for mentoring. So uh, we have uh, tried to show in this uh, diagram the uh, uh, high degree of interactions we try to maintain with our uh, fellow organizations. And uh, as we uh, work with uh, uh, with the connecting the country uh, uh, stakeholders with the uh, uh, supportive organizations, WHO, IAEA, IARC, and uh, work with our International Cancer Control Partnership to, to pull all those together, align the resources, and help them begin to move toward implementation of a plan uh, that uh, will help them reduce the cancer burden in their area. So. Uh, Great opportunities to work with these other organizations. Uh, IAEA has uh, wonderful resources and has done regular uh, interventions to assess the cancer problem in, in uh, many parts of the world with their impact studies and uh, understanding, um, of course, uh, the role or needs for radiation therapy, but also the broader needs for cancer control. And WHO, of course, through their uh, regional offices uh, has direct in-country support in many parts of the world to help us understand uh, where the needs are, get people lined up with the appropriate resources, and work together to uh, begin to build uh, collaborations for their support. So uh, that's uh, uh, really been a great process. So this, uh, this looks a little scary, but it's not too bad. But uh, we start with a country request, uh, move into uh, the process of developing their plan, help review and analyze it, and then uh, provide support with ECHO and uh, resources from WHO for prioritization, uh, understand the financial challenges and help them understand the needs uh, for uh, uh, paying for plan implementation and other resources uh, along the way. And then reassess, see how we're doing and, and begin again. The uh, ECHO program that we're using is uh, uh, based on uh, some work that was done uh, in person, pulling together representatives in various regional areas in the world for the last several years, sponsored by NCI. And these, uh, uh, these regional uh, summits were very productive, and basically we've tried to translate that into the ECHO model uh, so that uh, people uh, can continue to work together. We can provide technical support from uh, the various organizations and uh, help them move along the path toward uh, implementing the plans in their particular areas. 
So this is our current project working with the countries uh, uh, listed below and trying to uh, help them uh, uh, with their process. So there, there's some quite a bit of variation in the different uh, sorts of situations and the different sizes and types and levels of development of these countries, but they all work together, share information, build a learning community to help uh, improve uh, implementation and development of their, of their plans and ultimately to uh, reduce the cancer burden in their regions. So if you're familiar with uh, ECHO, it's, um, we're basically using a, a, a well-accepted approach that uh, has been uh, uh, adapted to this particular situation. So just real quickly, I uh, want to mention the uh, uh, portal that we have with uh, ICCP. This can be accessed through this uh, website, iccp-portal.org. And this contains uh, uh, a lot of information that can help you if you're interested in plan development, sort of how to get started, what's involved, uh, how to access and what's involved with technical assistance. And then you can actually access the cancer plans uh, from around the world through the uh, portal by clicking on this map that is uh, uh, interactive. So you may want to look at your own cancer plan for your own country if you haven't yet and take a look and see what's in there and see how things are going. So uh, lots of other information here on uh, the more detailed bits of, of cancer control. So uh, a lot of good information if you want to look at this. WHO is also uh, starting to implement a knowledge action portal. Keep, you want to keep an eye out for that. It's uh, uh, just about to, to be launched or may have already launched, but uh, take a look at that as well for other opportunities for learning. So uh, just uh, thanks to all of our team that uh, works together so well. Uh, my primary collaborator at MD Anderson is Dr. Ernie Hawk, who couldn't be with us today, but he sends his best. And uh, we work uh, closely with Shubra and the rest of the uh, MD Anderson team who are, who are all doing great work uh, and uh, salute them and their efforts as well. And hopefully this policy approach can help uh, move things along. Thank you. Thanks, Lou. As you heard from Lou, the ICPP ECHO uh, model uses technology to augment training of trainers for cancer control. I should also mention that the University of Texas is a Project ECHO super hub in that there are multiple um, Project ECHOs that are happening across our sister institutions, including one that I work on with Dr. Lee Revere addressing COVID-19 control among nursing homes. Just a quick reminder to please um, enter your questions in the Q&A box and your comments in the chat box. Thank you to Dr. Keith Martin and others who have done so already. Okay, next. I intentionally ordered the presentation so that Dr. Fenton's presentation comes before the Q&A because of the saying, what's not measured does not get done. So Dr. Fenton, over to you. Thank you, and I'm honored to be here today. Um, such wonderful projects going on. Um, and really from a global perspective in terms of informatics, it almost doesn't matter um, which country you're in. We know that people have, um, you can never have too much data and information. So um, I want to talk a little bit about public health informatics and population health informatics. And let's get started. So a lot of times you hear these two terms used synonymously. Um, for, for those of us in informatics, we tend to think of them as a little separate. So public health is very broad, can cover a lot of different types of data. Whereas when we think about population health informatics, we tend to think more narrowly with that data that truly is focused on population, um, recognizing that social determinants of health come into play there too. So public health informatics, obviously tracking the data, um, your immunization histories, your diseases um, at a lot of different levels. So for us, whether it's um, in the county here in the United States or in regions of a country or nationally, and aggregating that data so that we have the surveillance systems, um, but we also can aggregate it using search engine trends, right? Um, at, we're learning more and more about people searching for specific terms related to 
whatever's going on in their lives. And this can give us hints to what's happening in an area. Um, the different categories, we're looking at complex systems. So we're working on machine learning and predictive models of how diseases may be transmitted, although I realize this is on non-communicable diseases, or just how diseases may be found in different areas based on um, different industries that were in those areas. And can we improve the systems and, and keep those improvements over time? Data collection, obviously a lot of surveys for public health. Um, and I've given you two that we have here in the United States. Um, we've also got an electronic disease surveillance system. Again, using search engines, using social media, where you're talking about um, what's going on with people. We have one of our students doing a dissertation looking at how young adults with cancer interact on social media to understand um, what they're going through. And then obviously your other data sources. We can't forget about our geographical information systems. And I really like this picture that, that I pulled um, if you look here, this is Texas, where I'm located way over here, but we've got um, all of this here with the fine particulate matter. Um, obviously, this is where it's more desert-like, but it's also where the Texas border is against another country where you may have different regulations. So using those systems to help you understand what's happening in the public health context. Um, I give you a reference to a database here. Um, but the World Health Organization also has a tremendous number of resources available to you. Um, and these can be used in new and different ways. Um, but I did want to focus on the WHO Global Cancer Observatory. And there are, there's a huge number of databases out there for that. Um, and this is just one that I took, Marteus, the colon cancer mortality. And you can see here very clearly um, seeing how males have much more colon rect rectal and anal cancer than um, females do. And certainly even with colon cancer, the yellow is a little hidden here, but the green is the females with just colon cancer. So using all of those tools to understand. Population health informatics tends to be, again, a little bit more focused. Um, on here, I say EHRs. It could be from any patient records, um, any of your devices, and your consumer-focused internet-based tools. So those community health workers that we were hearing about earlier, what, whatever they're using to gather the data on the populations that they are working with, whether it's um, cancer or diabetes. Um, our health information technology identifies the populations and the subpopulations um, and hopefully continues to refine and improve the services provided and our understanding of what's going on with those patients. Um, often you'll see them using registries. Um, registries are subsets of data where you are very focused. Um, you can see here's some examples that I said were diabetes and heart disease, obviously all the cancer registries that we have so that you're fulfilling a specific purpose. So that's another use for population health. Um, we are seeing shifts in healthcare delivery and I think you see that um, with India and, and what's going on in Mozambique. Um, where it's really focused on the community and trying to build the sustainability in those communities at the individual level. So in summary, public health informatics, improving the health of persons in a specific geographical area, population where you're looking at us maybe at a specific disease or a specific condition, and we're seeing more and more both used um, to improve health across the globe. So with that, Gordon, I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you. Thanks, Susan. Um, Susan really bridged our discussion between the local and global levels. Overall, what a great set of presentations. 
you just heard about our panelists' efforts to build capacity for NCD control in several different resource um, challenge settings. With our remaining time, um, I like to go over a couple of questions that have not been addressed by um, the, um, the fellow audience in the Q&A box. So um, my fellow panelists, if you wouldn't mind turning on your camera, um, let's head into um, our first question, which is that uh, given your presentation, what would your recommendations be for a new um, global health program similar to yours so that it's one, context specific, and two, that it's replicable perhaps across settings within the same country or in different countries. Um, do you want me to start, Gordon? Okay. Um, I think, you know, obviously there's a lot of challenges now with the inability to travel, but I think Project ECHO is actually a great way. Um, I think one of the very important things is to um, have a very good understanding of what the challenges are. Obviously, I'm focused on cancer, but on either cancer prevention or cancer treatment services, um, and what the the needs of the collaborators you're working with are. Um, we've been very fortunate to work with Cecil Tina, who is a pathologist by training, uh, but also has the has the position in the ministry of running the cancer program. So she not only understands what's happening in her hospital, but also um, understands the policy changes that are needed. So I think that's been really important, but I think a, a good way to start is really just for everyone to get to know one another, figure out what the challenges are, and then also figure out what's realistic of what we, you know, like for us, what we can do from the MD Anderson side uh, to support the work. Thanks, Kathleen. Um, Lou, anything to add on the Project Echoes um, note? Uh, I think uh, what uh, is going to be needed is uh, is multiple options for engaging uh, countries in this work. So uh, uh, the Echo approach is is helpful for uh, those that are in a stage of development of their plans and are really ready to move on into implementation or have already started implementation. Others that are uh, just beginning or need some more formative work and may need more one-on-one uh, -on -one support. And uh, uh, I know uh, Dr. Baker, uh, Doug Perrin from NCI and, and uh, Kathleen and a number of others, our friends from uh, Brazil have worked uh, uh, with uh, Cecil Tina and her government uh, leadership to get their plan up and running. And that was uh, was a big milestone to really help move that along. So that more individual country work is is uh, certainly an important option. Uh, the, I kind of miss the face-to-face -face interactions. You know, we've had uh, a number of years of pulling together folks in the regions or having master courses at the uh, World Cancer Congress. So. Hopefully, uh, one day we'll be able to get back to that. There's really a lot to be gained, I think, from bringing people together and help them get to know each other and trust each other and be able to work together. Uh, as Kathleen mentioned, the, uh, uh, the real advantage of having had some in-country work before uh, COVID hit is just so important. And it's, it is, it's more challenging when you start off in the digital world uh, to begin with. So, so I think given multiple options, just, you know, the websites, uh, uh, as Dr. Fenton mentioned, uh, uh, are great places to go, but uh, we, we just have to keep a lot of channels open, I think. Yeah, great response. That's a good segue to the next question, um, which is on COVID-19. And, you know, I, I don't, I think any plenary session will be tone deaf without talking about COVID-19. But in this case, we'd like to hear how the pandemics impacted your individual programs and you know, how you've adapted like throughout the past year. Um, you know, it's not a one year, it's not a joyous one year anniversary that we just celebrated you know, since the WHO's declaration. But um, again, you know, uh, how have you adapted you know, the, the wonderful programs in Mozambique, Brazil, and of course I'll, I'll, I'll ask he, uh, Dr. Hima at some point about India but, um, and then of course, Susan in Texas as well. 
So I think for us, it was a big change. As I said, we were traveling to Mozambique, you know, five to six times a year um, and working, you know, with the, the doctors and nurses there doing a lot, a lot of hands-on training. Um, and once it became clear that we weren't going to be traveling anytime soon, we had a lot of, of these colposcopy and LEAP courses planned. Um, so Mila Salcedo from our group and Melissa Lopez, Ellen Baker said, okay, we got to go virtual and figure out how to do this. And um, it was amazing how, how quickly we were able to do it and how much interest there was in attending. And as I said, you know, doing lectures and things by Zoom and questions, you know, really works pretty well, um, but we were really struggling with the hands-on training. And as I said, fortunately, we had worked with a lot of people and our fellows were graduating, so they had become very proficient. So we really had them step up to the plate and run the hands-on sessions. And we have some great photos of the doctors in Mozambique showing their colleagues how to do the procedures with Dr. Salcedo and others on Zoom watching and, and sort of providing feedback. So I, I think, you know, it's possible. It's definitely not ideal. Surgery is obviously even more complicated, but we're starting to try different things until we can get back there um, in person. Others? So I can jump in if you want. You know, I think one of the things that COVID-19 did is it sort of, um, a lot of times for us in informatics, we tend to be in the background. Um, we tend to be, you know, behind the scenes working with the data and the information. And what, we, what we've really seen, um, and even when you start talking about the vaccine rollout, we've seen if you don't get the, the data and information part correct, um, it's really hard to get the rest of it correct. Um, and so for us, I think it's just been this focus on all of a sudden the, the needs um, that, that have just been sort of overwhelming where, again, like I said, where typically we tend to be in the background. So um, more training, better training, and of course, better systems. Yeah, I think they're, you know, they're just, uh, the COVID situation has just been uh, devastating in many ways to our cancer control work. And uh, I mean, it's just, uh, pulled resources, uh, necessarily pulled resources to deal with this public health emergency, but uh, it's, you know, so many of our programs uh, are, have been put on hold or, or set back uh, significantly. So there have been a number of uh, articles published. I think Dr. Sharpless uh, did a nice uh, commentary on this in JAMA around the, the uh, the expectation that delayed uh, screening and early detection, uh, much like what we've been talking about here, is going to result in significant increases in cancer mortality down the road as people present with more late stage disease. It just, you know, has set us back quite a ways. So uh, I put a little article in the chat. I wasn't quite sure how to circulate it around otherwise that uh, our uh, group with the ICCP did, but it just is. Basically, it's just uh, saying that the cancer control is even more important now and doing this work. You know, we have to get back up on our feet and, and get going again as soon as, uh, as, soon as this, uh, this disaster passes. Uh, we'll have to get back to the work that we know is so important in, in dealing with cancer. A question came through the Q and A just now. Um, that's um, that I'll direct primarily to Susan, but other other panelists um, can feel free to jump in. And that's on the the value of data. Um, Bradley, who posted, wanted to know that how can we ensure that data is shared appropriately in the communities, the same communities where the data is generated from. Yeah, that that is the the sixty four million dollar question. <laughs> Um, in some respects, it's something we struggle with a lot. Um, we are, right now, I'm engaged in several projects where we're working and trying to help low resource clinics um, implement systems to, to monitor for those chronic conditions, right? So for diabetes and heart disease and um, colorectal cancer, all of those things. And you, um, 
you really see them so wrapped up in just delivering the care that we can provide them with lots of reports, lots of data and information, but we have to do it in a way that makes it usable for them. And I think, I think that's, that's the answer. Now, what does that mean? It's different for everyone. And that's why this is, it's really such a struggle is because it is different for everyone. It is so context specific. It's so process specific. So I wish I had an easy answer for you, but I don't. <laughs> well, no, that's a very good one already. Um, we're at the top of the hour. And so um, what I like you know, to say is overall, um, I hope that you know, in, in listening to the various presentations that um, you're feeling a little bit more optimistic about the future, specifically about NCD control um, on national and global level. And um, again, I want to thank, you know, my fellow panelists like Susan Fenton, Louis Fox Hall, Cecilina Lorenzoni, Kathleen Schmiller, and um, Hima Gopalan, and the organizers of the CGA 2021. To the audience members, um, I hope you enjoyed the rest of the proceedings and um, we'll interact um, in the same conference and or next year. Okay, take care. Be well. <laughs>